Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds, fish nerds, fish nerds, it's a podcast. Hello and welcome to the Fish Nerds, the show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I'm Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd, Licensed Fishing Guide, your best friend, joined by my co-host, the Crappy Hippie. Hello, Clay. Good morning. Great to see you here for the show that's usually funny. Always interesting. No, usually that's funny. always interesting, usually funny, and mostly true. I am <laughs> Crappie Hippie, your tree-hugging redneck from eastern Kansas and co-founder of Glasswater Angling Lead-Free Lures. You can check out our products at glasswaterangling.com. Right now, I've got jig heads going out the door every single day. People are tying up jigs, getting ready to put on some plastics and they're wanting a lead-free way to do it. So I am really, really busy. You know, I should plug my business. Go to fishnerds.com to check out all the, all the last, all the catalog podcasts. Plus the fishing guide service will be open for business in just a few days. So our pontoon boat's getting ready to go back in the water to hopefully put some fish in people's hands. So, well, that sounds fantastic. So the yep. giant fortress of snow that formed around it has melted away at last. Oh, it melted away a long time ago. And then the weather got sour. I didn't feel like doing anything. So I got lazy. <laughs> and then I was going to put the boat in the water last week and I realized I had no propeller. So I had to order. <laughs> I had to order. I forgot. I, I trashed the one coming out in the fall. So I had to buy a new one and I forgot to buy it. <laughs> so it won't be until Monday. You need to buy those by the case, my friend. Um, it's terrible. Like it, it, it's a long story. But when they, in the fall here, when, when it gets, starts getting cold, they do what's called a lake drawdown. When they lower the level of the lake, <laughs> so when it freezes, it doesn't, you know, wreck docks and things like that and if your boat's still in the water when you come out the boat launch now has 10 feet less space of deep water and now you're all in shallow rock bed you gotta you have to drive across those rocks to get to the to get to the boat launch uh. you have no choice like you <laughs> just you have to just close your eyes and go okay there's two hundred dollars <laughs> just go you hear oh, that you... crunch grind 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 crunch you're like oh, oh no <laughs> that's a, you know, well that's when you take one of the kids and a and you get a couple big poles and you pull it into place. Yeah, my kids are useless. All right, so let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about what's happening on today's podcast. A lot going on today, John. Yeah, we have a lot going on today. Uh, I got Amy Robeson, the Oklahoma Pond Lady, to come in and talk to us about algae because I love doing some frogging, mm -hmm. but I also get tired of what we call pond snot being mm -hmm. on my line, being on my lure, getting in my guides. So algae is both a blessing and a curse and we're going to talk about that for a little bit then we got some great fish in the news today we got some happy sea lions we've got our serious story on shrinking fish and we're going to mm -hmm. talk about that and then you got a beautiful fun wonderful story about killer whale i.e yeah orca yeah. fashion orcas wearing hats orcas doing this orcas doing that yep and then We've got for our featured guest, we are welcoming back Kim Burnett, the crappie stopper, who was on Local Legends on the January 24th, 2019 episode. Well, he is back to talk about his side hustle and how he manages it and uh, give a few tips on folks that are looking to do the same thing. He's a fun follow on Facebook, too, and you can watch him tie up his jigs and catch some great fish. So worth the yeah, follow. He, yeah. He, yeah, he's very much worth a follow. He's a lot of fun. All right. Well, that's that's great. So before we do that, you've been fishing. I have been fishing, and I'll tell you one thing. I don't know. Is the shad run going on there, or is it over? It's happening or? right now. Happening right now. How is it doing? Uh, I, well, so I've been watching uh, the Amskeg Fishways website. Amskeg uh, Fishways is the fish ladder Dave Kellum and I used to work at, and we count migratory fishes. And so far, and that's three dams up from the from the first dam. So so far, no shad have come by the viewing window. I saw the first lamprey a couple days ago. Herring are there today, and the shad should be right behind them. So we're waiting for the shad. And sometimes the state of New Hampshire uh, will pick up the shad at the first dam on the river, the Merrimack River in Lawrence, and put them in a truck. It's called the Shad Mobile, and they'll drive oh. them and bypass all the dams and put them in their spawning grounds to skip it off. <laughs> just a well, little chauffeur service. So we don't know what we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Well, I'm just saying, you know, the. The white bass run around here has been really unpredictable. It was it was just dismal. It really didn't happen this year. But one thing you can count on in Kansas, at least if you're a pond and creek fisher like me, small lake fisher and so on, is bluegill fishing. Uh, and it's either 
even on lousy years, it's still really good. And there's no lousy years, year for bluegill fishing. No it's lousy year good. for bluegill. <laughs> it's either good or phenomenal. And guess mm-hmm. what? This May has been as nice a May as you're going to get in this state. And the bluegill fishing is addictively on, 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 on. Well, I mean, I mean, they it's fight so for fun. their size. They fight every bit as good as any other fish. What is your primary technique for bluegills? Well, of course, I love to fly fish for them. I have a little, mm-hmm. little tiny six and a half foot fly rod. That's rods, the way to go. Size yep. two. Uh, that's mm-hmm. a lot of fun. And then, of course, you know, I'm an ultralight guy. I have like six, seven, eight ultralights. And I, I like using just a slow falling jig of some kind. Yep. Uh, I prefer natural, but by gosh, um, I, you know, those, those TPEs, those elastomer plastics like, um, mm-hmm um z man makes um uh, z uh not z tech but what anyway they're La- uh, elazitech or something uh, yeah Elaz elaztech thank yeah. you very much yeah that last tech but that's not the only one but they, they, it's a floating plastic so when you put them on a jig head they they descend super slow and that drives bluegill bass and crappie bananas mm-hmm. so those are my two favorite ways and of course if i'm in a snaggy place or a weedy place i will we've talked about this a lot i will throw a bobber on there just to mm-hmm. keep it out of the goop and if I'm fishing with someone new, then that helps them know what's going on. Yep, not a favorite bobber. My favorite is is fly fishing. I agree with you on that. They'll eat they'll eat any fly. It doesn't make any difference. Um, but I like to use if they're biting heavy and really feeding. I like to use tiny poppers. Um, oh yeah, on a fly rod, and just because I love all the splashing and they miss more than they hit, but it's just so fun to watch all that. <laughs> exactly 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 and we're going to mention a fly uh down in my conversation with mr burnett i also like to use the hopper dropper on them that's a mm-hmm. lot of fun but i'll tell you you know the other day kim and i were fishing and he was trying some different colors and so was i and i'll tell you once we got into both putting on a black i put on a little 64th black jig and he put on a little black uh, fly he calls the house fly and once we got into black strikes more than doubled and really? it's basically a fish of cast so you can zero in on them yes you mm-hmm. can yep i like hot pink that's my that's my go-to number one color for for fishing and then i switched to white or black from there well there you go i look in kim's uh hopper box and he's got tan and black and you know those colors and then he's got purple pink chartreuse mm-hmm. so i don't know how many there's no chartreuse no chartreuse in my box I know it's I, not allowed. I, I refuse. I I will not use it. <laughs> I have standards, <laughs> <laughs> and nobody knows what color it is anyway. It's not a thing. All right, so let's <laughs> let's let's move into the some content here, John. Why don't we get get into it with the pond lady? Hey, fish nerd nation! Welcome to Glasswater Angling World Headquarters Podcast Recording Studios. And today, this morning, right now, I have with me. Amy Robeson, the Oklahoma Pond Lady. Hey, John, how are you today? I am doing great and even better now that you're here in the studio because I have a few questions about a plant that can be a problem, but I think it also can be a benefit. It just kind of depends on what it's doing. And the plant I want to talk about is algae. Oh, my gosh. One of my favorite subjects. Well, fishers face algae woe. A lot of farm chemicals, agrochemical, a lot of lawn chemical going in, putting all that extra potassium. Phosphorus. I mean, phosphorus. Excuse me. Yeah, but <laughs> uh, okay. It's a, but of the MPK, it's the P. Yes. And a lot of us think, you know, go around thinking it's all about the nitrogen, but it's actually the phosphorus that causes these explosions. On the other hand, uh, I have a feeling that we cannot just get one-sided or uh, binary about this or anything else that algae is either good or bad, because it's my understanding that it composes the very most basic level of the food pyramid in a pond. So absolutely guide me through this guide me through i like the fish and algae mat as long as it's not too too bad but when it covers an entire pond and just ruins it and cuts the productivity of the pond makes spawning difficult and so on uh, i get a bit frustrated most anglers do but before we get to that point let's talk about let's go ahead and start with the good side let's talk about when the when the bio machine is working properly in a pond and what What's so good about algae, Angie? I mean, 
What's so good about algae, Amy? Well, you know, I like to talk about algae as the good, the bad, and the toxic. So in a pond or aquatic ecosystem as a whole, you have your critters that eat plants and you have your plants, whether they're rooted vegetation, macro vegetation, or algae. You have the things that photosynthesize that create the basis of your your entire web and in, in your system, right? So algae is the the simplest of your plant life. And so generally it's also the first to become abundant when water temperatures warm up, you start getting lots of sunlight, it can, you know, become explosive. But for the good side, because it is the first thing to get going, then it's usually the first resource that the critters that eat plants have to start their productivity. So, you know, you have phytoplankton, which are your algae, whether they're the single celled or the filamentous, like the mats you're talking about. And then you have zooplankton, which are the single celled organisms that eat the phytoplankton, right? So in order to feed those guys, you have to have something. And after a long winter, when things have slowed down, and your rooted vegetation dies off, then the first thing to get going and use that phosphorus that's entered the system over the winter time is your algae. So that's usually the first plant that starts taking off in a pond after the winter. And in a good situation, that starts the whole process going, gets everybody some food, some groceries, so to speak, and the bad side, though, is that it can become a nuisance. So like you said, it can be hard to fish in. But the the bad side of that is even worse. You can have so much that it depletes oxygen and can essentially get to the point that it's so thick that it causes a fish gill. So if it becomes persistent, that can be a huge problem. Or if it covers a large area of the top of the pond then you know you've got excessive nutrients. So another part of algae, go ahead. All right, I, I, I've got to slow you down because I can tell oh, you, yeah. you're, you're, you're on a roll. I'm going to take off. Turned on by algae and I love it. Uh -huh. But um, I just wanted to say that, that yeah, when it gets it going in the spring, you know, we, we were catching a lot of bluegill last fall. They were running small and early this spring, we caught some uh, running small, but boy, when that pond amped up and the machinery really got going, these bluegill within 30, 40 days put on so much weight and really got going, you know, and the pond was still nice and clear and, and we didn't have any problems. What species of algae is that? I mean, you talked about a filament algae and a single cell allergy, which allergy Allergy. That's between allergy <laughs> and that's if you're allergic to aller uh, algae. <laughs> algae. You have an allergy. But uh, no, the algae that is that one cell uh, kindly non map forming algae uh, uh -huh. is that that's apparently different than the filament style that makes them right. Up? So species, I, you know, it can be a little bit difficult to identify species. We don't need to go down that far. But essentially, there are single celled algae types that usually are suspended in the water col column. They will sort of turn the water green. You get a mm -hmm. sort of a green cast throughout the entire body of water. And then the filamentous algae is really what forms the, the mats, so to speak. They're long stringy, or they can be sort of like clouds that are fuzzy on top of the water. Um, they can be associated with the substrate or float. And those really are the ones that can become more problematic. We prefer the the ones that are in the water column more because they tend to, in, the, in a healthy system, be used up quicker and utilized. Whereas the filamentous kinds, the ones that get stringy that you get caught up in when you're fishing, those can really kind of um, just become not the best resource for a lot of things. They're useful, but they're not as easy to approach. A lot of those types create a mucilaginous covering, real slimy. So it's, it's not as much of a preferred food source for 
your plankton, your your critters that eat those guys as the single celled guys. So well, can um, I ask one thing? Is it sure. good for other things? Are there insects like caddis or is there insects that might use it? I love fishing it when it's in a healthier pond where it's around the edges and there's just a, a, a mat of it here or there or just a little bit of edge. Bass sure love to lay underneath it in that shade right. and hunt. So there must be some minnows and some things kind of coming around and of course they're they're looking up because uh, a snake or a mouse or a baby muskrat what have you is going to come across that pond climb up on that to take a rest for a minute and a lot of times <laughs> that, that's the last thing it ever does there's nothing more fun than frog and that, a, a mat right and that's what i would that's really how i think about it in my mind is that those filamentous types become sort of more like habitat Whereas the single celled types are more utilized as a direct food source, not saying the filament is, isn't, but that's sort of how I think about it in terms of the usefulness in a pond um, when you're in check. Now, obviously, this is we're talking about the good side, not when things get out of control, um, but th that is generally how I approach this in terms of utilization by the other organisms in the pond is that it does tend to, to seem like it's more habitat than direct food. Of course you do have grazers. Like you said, your, your caddis flies, your macro inverts, your aquatic larvae are much more likely to directly predate on your filamentous types. Whereas your zooplankton the smaller crustaceans like the daphnids and the copepods are going to utilize the single celled algae more effectively because uh they're more their size you know so you're just talking about different levels of that trophic cascade who who utilizes what so in 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 a healthy system where things are in check that's more how i think about the role of these different types of algae that is so interesting. And I have actually been around some ponds where it happens a lot in what they call cattle tanks or cattle ponds where the cattle kind of keep the filamentous algae beat up and unable to mat. And that there is so much of the single cell, the water is just basically pea green. So even yes. the single cell can get with all that manure and stuff going in there can get uh, pretty crazy and or especially on duck ponds. Uh, I know oh, yeah. you have a thing about don't feed the ducks and all that. And I have seen, yeah, once again, the ducks dibble dabbling around, they're gobbling up that filamentous algae. They're paddling it apart with their movements, but boy, the rest of the pond is just, just pea soup. Well, and I think you're kind of getting into the realm of the bad and the toxic side of algae, because one of the types of algae that we deal with is actually blue green algae. And those guys are the ones that can really take off and become extra abundant. They are more of a planktonic type of algae that is suspended in the water column or stays on the surface. But and with, ex go ahead. Well, I'm trying to be as smart as you. And I, I think I know the word for them. Is, is it protus? Is that the right word? Well, cyanobacteria, but yes, I mean, you're, you're talking about something that's more like a, a bacteria than an actual algae. They just okay. get sort of lumped in. Well, they got their own kingdom though. They're all, they're their there. own guys. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And, but and, they're still in the realm. In the realm of what we're algae. talking about. Yeah. From exactly. a pond manager standpoint, this is what you're looking at. You, you, you don't want to get down, you know, on the, on the spectrum of disaster we're pretty much to the far end by the time this stuff starts showing up, correct? Well, I mean, it's ubiquitous. It's definitely always present in systems. A lot of times it's more associated with the substrate, but when you have excessive phosphorus and you have a, a lot of pressure on your green algae, which your filamentous algae, your, your phytoplankton, your planktonic algae that we were talking about are more like your green algae. There are some other types of planktonic algae, like the, the golden algae, brown algae, things like that. But the blue green algae, the cyanobacteria really become predominant when you have too much pressure on the green algae, usually from chemical control. So if you were to use uh, algicide, most often copper sulfate repeatedly to try to control issues with the green algae, that sort of selects for your blue green algae and especially in high phosphorus conditions like 
where somebody's feeding the ducks and geese or you have a, a duck pond, a cattle pond, something like that, where there is excessive nutrient loading and a lot of pressure on the green algae, you end up with blue green algae. So that's a whole different beast altogether, but they definitely form those big aggregates that you see on top floating on the water. Um, usually kind of have a funky smell, look like pea soup, like you said, that pea soup look. So that's definitely in the realm of the, the bad and possibly toxic side of algae. Not that they're not present and they do always exist. We just got to keep them in check. And so having some green algae does keep your blue green algae in check. Wow. Now that is fascinating to me, but what is not uh, well, it's all fascinating to me, but I'm sitting there thinking, wow, it's all about balance, baby. You know, it's all about, the harmony. <laughs> it's all about the, you know, the yin yang, you know, it's not that blue green algae, bad, bad, anything that's the, the single cell can get out of hand. The filament just can get out of hand. Then uh, we can tumble the wrong way and we tumble the wrong way. And, and we get a blue green algae thing to where blue green algae is now out of proportion uh, for its role in the pond. It's, it's doing, it's taking advantage. And you know, there, 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 there's no anthropomorphism here. It's just the fact that, Hey, there's nutrients all over the place. And therefore we got the nutrients we're going to grow. And, and, um, I just, anyway, it, I hope it's as fascinating to the listeners as it is to me, because I got to thinking about this when you had me start treating the pond with pond works and it's worked beautifully. Uh -huh. And the water now is so clear because our shoreline aquatic and riparian zone plants are just wonderful. So lush this year after the, the drought and everything, uh, they really right. got to establish. And I noticed a little clumps of algae starting in on the bottom. And then by the middle of March, we had a lot of mild weather this spring. So, you know, middle of March, beginning of April, we started getting you know, a mat, you know, starting to form. And I was like, ah, I'm going to have to come back and treat. But what happened was we got some good rains and it lifted that those mats up and deposited them off on the, in the riparian zone, off on the grass and such. Right. And when the pond came back down, it got stranded. So there was a natural control for it right there. And right now it seems to be happy. Things seem to be kind of, I think that flooding is kind of part of my cycle. Would you it agree? Definitely is. Well, and I, I think you really hit on something that is super important. And that is that a healthy pond should have some algae bloom issues at the very beginning of the spring. And I, I say issues, I shouldn't say issues. Healthy systems need to have algae blooms. That's just indicative of having enough nutrients to get that machine going, like you had said earlier. But you want them to get consumed um, or, like you said, get flooded out. You really want those algae blooms to come on and then go away on their own without really having to treat with a chemical control agent. You want to get to the point to where your, your vegetation starts taking off, utilizes the nutrients the algae was using, then sort of starves out the algae and it gets back in check when you really have a problem is when the algae comes on and doesn't really go away on its own. If you have to start thinking about treatment with a chemical agent, then really what you've got is a nutrient problem that's not being addressed, which is where the pond works comes in. You know, those, those good bacteria get in there. They utilize the nutrients that are feeding the algae, create competition because you got to have balance, baby, got to have balance. So when you have something that's in check, in balance, then all of these different factors should come on as a succession. You get the algae bloom, it should go away, you get your rooted vegetation taken off, and that's, that's really, you know, indicative of a healthy pond. Well, you've got me so excited. Amy, thank you for coming in this morning. It's always great to hear from you. I'm just glad that my pond is going through this cycle the way it ought to. I, 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 it's crazy, but I am, you know, you and I, we're pond geeks. We are turned on. I, I just, I just love it. I love the fact that, you know, I got all ready to treat with the pond works. And then I, I said, just, just give it a chance to do its thing on its own. Don't be such a, a hovering parent and, you know, go, you know, <laughs> immediately go, go to the, to the aid. And, and as, as long as it, it keeps but going through still, the cycle. You know, yeah, I'd still rather you run to the, Pro probiotics then you know Absolutely. a problem we see over and over 
is the the algae side you know if and especially if if you do have to resort to the pond works it's still better than treating with a chemical agent we'd rather biological control if we have to do some kind of intervention but the fact that you didn't even need the pond works that's very encouraging that means that we're we're on this trajectory things are going well things are healthy they're they're doing what they should do and there's really not that need whether it is necessitated by the pond or by people's perception of a chemical control. So I'm very proud. I'm very, I'm a proud mama, proud pond mama. I'm very excited that things are going well. I, I, I love this stuff. You know, I'm, I've gotten a name for sort of being into the algae when a lot of people aren't because it's important. You have to have some, if you kill it all out, it's just the, the, the machine's not going to work. So well, it is it's part of the plan, just like the turtles and all this stuff, things that you think are hurting the fish and can, but mostly they're part of the plan. If they're in balance, it's, it's all doing what it's supposed to do. And you're going to have plenty of fish and fish are going to be healthy and want to bite and all that kind of stuff. Well, what do you say? We come back and do a couple more of these, talk about some other aspects of algae. I want to talk about spawn and I want to talk about some other things, but, uh, uh, Oh, that gets that- me frisky. All right. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, then, until next time, thank you, Amy Robeson, the Oklahoma Pond Lady, and we shall see you soon. Thank you, John. Okay. So, does that make you? Of course, you don't have that same algae. I was going to say, does that make you feel better? But up there in New Hampshire, you have what I call nice weeds, friendly weeds. You don't really have big algae issues, do you? We have a little bit cooler water, I think. Um, there are some ponds in southern New Hampshire that do have those issues. And our rivers have rock snot. They call it rock snot. And it's the same kind of stuff that grows on the surface of rocks. Yeah, but that's called what? Didimo or that's something a different like it. It's a little bit different. Critter. Yeah, it's different. Yeah. It's still an algae, I think, but it's very different. Oh, it's yucky. It's yucky. Yeah. But uh, no, we don't have a problem with that. We have weeds, of course, but not not like what she's talking about. Uh, maybe yeah. some farm ponds will have stuff like that on it. It really has to be slow water. Um, yeah, slow water, water. Our water moves out pretty quick. Exactly, and also our for tur- our for tur- turlity. Uh, sound like <laughs> the tur uh, the turgot lady. Uh, our fertility tends to be higher, even if there's no wash and you know man made nutrient coming in. Uh, Kansas has, I mean, we have a very humid climate. Yeah. Uh, now, are almost, your ponds natural or man made mostly? They're all man-made There's, so there it is yeah it's pretty yeah. much yeah um i mean we have some marshes that are natural mm-hmm. unfortunately we used to have thousands of them they were all plowed under in the 60s uh, uh i won't get into that because well, you gotta a, build cul-de-sacs man <laughs> I, I don't know what you gotta build but it's it's nice to see where people have left them and the irony is we have a river called the Meridocene, which means marshes of the swan and they've actually built some marshes and now pump water out of the Meridocene into those marshes mm-hmm. for the swans and the geese, which is crazy because men could have just left the marshes that were there alone. And now because of farming and such, we have to make artificial marshes, but I guess that's better than none. Well, I think every 50 years, you could look at back at where you are now. So drop back 50 years or go 50 years from now. And we'll look at what we're doing now for management and go, man, that was dumb. The stuff that we think is smart now. <laughs> so we don't know, you know, we, we don't know. It's people do the best they can when they do it. I guess, you know, you have such a positive view. I like <laughs> it. I like it. I like it because I need it. I absolutely need it. Yeah. And you know what else I need my brother? Some news, some fish in the news. Let's go. I love fish in the news. All right, John, take the lead with some happy sea lions. All right. This story was sent in by our own Tim Tacklebox Beat, and it's an awful lot of fun. Uh, the sea lions at Pier 39 in San Francisco Bay are at an all-time 15-year high, and that is because there has been a big influx of anchovies and herring. The, the great thing about the Pier 39 story is when they redid it and they hadn't you know, rented out all the space and they hadn't made all the arrangements for the boats and everything else. And people, you know, hadn't, hadn't gotten in there. Um, well, the sea lions were swimming around going, boy, isn't that cool? Mm-hmm. And they started coming in and, and using it, uh, for a man-made natural, well, natural to them and enjoying it. And of course there was a big flap from the people that think we ought to just grab 
mother nature buy her stuff and yank her around and make her behave. And they were like, we need to get rid of them. They smell, they're noisy, they're this, they're that. Until what? Happened? Money of them. They make money. Money. People attraction. started showing up to looking at, you know, to look at them. And the don't hurt the sea lion people were, didn't even really have to get in too big of a uproar over it because they're, you've got thousands of people coming down here. They look at the sea lions for five minutes and they come over to your restaurant. So what are you cranking about? You know, right. you're going to make some money. You're going to sell some t-shirts. You're going to do all the things. And that's what, you know, that's what you do. And if it helps the sea lions, even better. So, well, but, even but they've better. only been there since like 1989. So yeah, that's what, when they redid it. So, yeah, you know, it, it, it's, uh, but anyway, they counted over a thousand Woo. a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, uh, you look at this picture and there's of course, uh, you know, hundred some people there looking at these docks with all these crashed out nappy sea lions on them which is just i don't know it's it's you talk about something that's really pleasant mm-hmm. seeing an animal just in total chill mode every now and then a flipper moves every now and then they kind of brush something off their face just you know it, it reminds me of me sleeping i guess <laughs> right right well it's cool and you know it's, it's funny the unwittingly built habitat <laughs> they built the perfect spot for sea lions so celebrate it exactly well, and, and of course, sea lions are a great indicator species. Um, we, you know, we don't want to, oh, the oceans are saved. It's all over because they talk about the density of the bait fish can change and is changing from time to time, not just because of climate change, but because of just the way the oceans are. Mm-hmm. Um, but but they say it's always good to see a big influx of sea lions because it, it does mean at least here now, right now, this is a healthy spot and everything is cool. Well, good. Congratulations on the sea lions. I bet it smells terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, it's, I, I got a dairy up the road from me when they're mucking out the barns and stuff. You know, people mm-hmm. are like, ah, it's manure. It's not terrible. It's not good. It's just a thing. And it comes and goes and it's, a, you know, live with it. Well, they'll, they'll survive it. Plus they're making money. So who cares? Well, they're making money and it's cooperating with nature and it fits right in with the whole Hey, can't we have both? Well, in this case we can, if everybody just chills a little bit, and uh doesn't need you know i i'm sorry but a lot of air freshener makes me sick I, I'll, I'll take the sea lions you know over oh. artificial rows okay oh from I'm, grandma's I'm, house i'm with you with that i, I get <laughs> i get asthma from artificial smells you go ever go in someone's house is like ultra clean but like clean to the point where uh. they don't they, they clean with so many products the house just smells all perfumed i, I get asthma yes. I, I get asthma attacks from that i can't deal <laughs> i can't deal I well mean, then you can come <laughs> my house is that, a that will mess. not happen to you in my no. house my, my house smells <laughs> you, like chickens you, you are welcome my friend you <laughs> yeah. come on over here yeah it either smells like good cooking or me so hopefully yeah. <laughs> it'll be a day i'm cooking something good good well perfect all right cool good story there i like a nice happy happy sea lion story let's talk about some shrinking fish john well let's talk about shrinking fish uh there's a whole bunch of research going on now because and i just I'm just going to collate or just kind of talk about several articles at once. I put in three um, because we'll links in the three, show notes. Yeah. yeah, the links are in the show notes. That's what I mean when I say I put in three. I got three articles down here for you. I'm just going to kind of talk about them all. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not going to do a deep dive and mention specific scientists and specific university projects. You can look this up, but it's fascinating because the consensus is yes, fish overall are shrinking in the ocean. There are fewer of the big, big, huge fish that we used to have at the top end of the pyramid is being reduced is being lopped off as being a, a kind of curve and you're saying over. shrinking you're saying the median size of these fishes are smaller like physically smaller fish yes the yeah. median size yeah the median uh, size is going down so uh, remind me at the end of this your discussion at the end of your discussion you're rising hang on remind me john at the end of your discussion uh when i was in college i wrote a paper on shrinking fishes i did a whole research project on this and my conclusion was different than uh, this oh except for one of them now actually I'm looking at one now maybe uh, contradicts my conclusion so i'm looking forward to this <laughs> so go ahead now well the the fun you know the thing about it is that there are shorter term man-made causes like commercial fishing and recreational fishing that have, are responsible for taking a lot of these top predators mm-hmm. or these top uh pyramid pyramid uh, apex apex fish taking these apex fish out of the ocean um, there are also natural causes for it that have been going on since fish have existed. And then there are some theoretical causes that these scientists are working over. Uh, one of which, for example, is the this is kind of a chicken and egg 
type thing, though. They're saying, well, because of the warmer water, that gill size is smaller, mm-hmm. and therefore they're not getting, uh, they're having to work harder for oxygen. They're burning more calories. Um, it's one idea, but a lot of scientists are attacking it, and some scientists have said, no, that's discredited. Um, one one sci- uh, one was done here in the United States where they took brook trout, and they raised brook trout in a 55-degree environment, and they raised them in a 68 degree environment which is the very edge of what brook trout can tolerate i was gonna say you're raising dead fish (laughs) yeah you're about to well it really stressed them and they did not grow as big but um, gill size remained proportional it it did not um they did all kinds of tests on you know i see what you're saying so so gill size was smaller because the fish is smaller it's like having a smaller human their thumb is gonna be smaller so just, right, it, and it's kind tracks. of you know, which came first, the smaller gill or the smaller fish, and mm-hmm. and um, um, you know other scientists are are like, well, that doesn't make any sense. If they need more oxygen rather than move a small gill more rapidly, shouldn't they be evolved? You know, mm-hmm. you know, and then we get into what's evolution, what's adaptation. I don't know. That's well, and how long does it take? You can't, you know, if, if, if evolution takes a lot more time, then climate change has been a problem. So it's going to take a long time for fish to adapt. It, right, right, yeah. and and so there's other. Uh, theories and other things are working on for example just like the straight up you know it is temperature temperature stresses fish in a variety of ways if they're um, um, stressed you know by heat and then then you know they may tend to grow smaller just to tolerate it but um and i want to get into your 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 science and, and your paper and stuff but there was one cool thing that scientists say hey wait a minute uh, and I love the cooperation and the, and with the with the data exchange and everything mm-hmm. else. These scientists are all really able to move rapidly on some of this stuff. But the, like they say, sometimes conditions favor a certain type of uh, forage fish over another. So mm-hmm. when, for example, the Japanese sardine has an explosion in population, it feeds on the same sort of zooplankton and the same sort of things that another forage fish say a herring or an alewife or a grunion or whatever so all of a sudden that forage fish is not as prevalent okay so if the fish you're targeting in a study is feeds on grunions or alewives and they're less abundant because there's a surge in the population of japanese sardines then those fish are going to be smaller but there's going to be an explosion both in size and numbers of fish like mackerel that feed very heavily on mm-hmm. the japanese sardines so we get back to that winners and losers scenario that is actually just a natural part of the system right so normal cycle yeah kind of a normal cycle that that comes and goes but they're still you know they're finding it they they mention these 15 species over and over again but nobody makes me a a really good list i know mackerel is one of them um they like mackerel because they're everywhere and they might easy to catch (laughs) easy to catch easy to find easy to study but and then anyway um yeah i can't wait i i you know uh, these people you folks that live around the ocean and catch mackerel all the time you're like what's wrong with this guy you know i'm the guy that wants to go to florida not to catch tarpon or or giant bass i want to catch bluegill i want to go catch a mackerel on my ultralight out of the ocean you know (laughs) it's so fun we do we do we take the kids out um once a year and we we fish them with them with small bass rods and you fish with them you you can use one just like a diamond jig or you can fish like a uh-huh. sabiki, which has like six hooks on it. And I, my prefer- preference is, is multiple hooks because I want to catch three, four mackerel at a time on a light rod. <laughs> yeah. And it's a blast. It's so fun. They, they're, well, they're a mess. They stink. They bleed everywhere. Most people don't eat them, but they are good to eat. So I hear it. Yeah. I hear it. I hear it. I hear a lot of people say they're, they're really good to eat. And I, you know, uh, I, that those things like stinking and bleeding, that, you know, a lot of fish do that. Sure. I don't care. Well, you have your, your, you know, your mackerel is an oily fish too. So it has fish flavor. It's not just a, your, your boar. It's not just cod, you know, it doesn't, it tastes like more than the seasonings you put on it. And yeah. most Americans, when they complain about, I don't like fish because they don't want things to taste fishy. What they mean is they don't want to taste fish. They want to taste the breading and the seasonings, <laughs> not the fish. They want that flaky white meat, but no flavor. Exactly. Kind of yeah. like the chicken breast thing. All right. Well, listen, yeah. talk about your paper, my brother. Oh, so when I was in on. college, this is back in the 90s. I did a paper on striped bass and there was a problem in the 90s. First population was dropping. They were saying, they were claiming, and they were claiming that the uh, median size of, of stripers was small. 
And so I did a research project on this, and my project was not well researched. I was really kind of BSing my way through it, but I did come to the conclusion through, and I found some data to support it uh, that uh, that the that population may not be dropping as much as people are claiming, uh, but the, keep, the amount of people, amount of fish people are keeping is less because the average size of fish is smaller. And the reason the average size of fish is smaller was akin to like, let's imagine you take every every human over six feet tall and don't allow them to reproduce. You take them out of the population. Well, they're going to have kids that over time are going to be on average smaller. And if if your striped bass have to be over, say, 26 inches to keep them, and so you're keeping every fish over 26 inches, throwing back or leaving behind the ones that are 25 inches or less, if you start having males who can reproduce or females can reproduce at 24 inches, you might have just shorter fish just through diversity. It's just a normal way it works. So I did a paper on that. It was like a 15-page research paper. And some of it was I was finding sources to support my conclusion before I, before I knew anything because I was on last-minute papers. You know, when you're in college, you cheat a little bit. Um, but <laughs> I also yeah. found, it, I found some data to back it up. <laughs> well, of course, uh, Doc Martin would look at that and go, oh, come on. <laughs> and what grade would Doc Martin have given you? Well, it depends on if she could smell through my BS or not. She would smell through your BS. <laughs> I, I imagine she's through it pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Yeah. So what are we talking? C minus? I, I got a B plus on it. Oh, well, there in you my go. biology class. But yeah, doc, I would have passed doc class, but she would have, uh, <laughs> she would have given me some stink eye about it for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you, that's one thing about slots and, and, and length limits and stuff is uh now they tend to be bookended. Now yes. it's this, and they can be crazy, crazy precise. So, uh, you know, I've heard of slots that are, we're just like Joe Henry last week, how, how tight the sturgeon slot is. And, mm -hmm. and Todd fish wrap rider talks about how tight the striped bass slot can be where he fishes. And, uh, so yeah, you want to, you want to let those, those older, uh, specimens that are given those genes for size, you want to make sure you preserve them. If you just have a, a, um, um, you know, has to be over. A minimum slot like that, then you're going to be in a difficulty eventually. I think. Well, absolutely, and that's why, like, like around in New Hampshire and a lot of other states, there's ice fishing derbies, and they they catch and kill every fish that they want to, you know, get a prize for. And you're winning a prize for the biggest fish. You're taking out the best breeders, and you're going to have a smaller fish. Just it's not the math in that hard. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, it, it's really not that hard to uh, to understand that the potential of, of skimming off all the big ones. Yeah. It's like, like you say, then they're, the genes are gone. They're gone, whether it's a human being or a fish. Mm -hmm. Well, there it is, John. Now, you know, <laughs> all right, let's talk about orcas well, now in I know fashion. Least, I've got yeah. more to wonder about. Well, I'm, I'm I want to orcas in fashion. Let's, let's hear it. Well, uh, you know, I wonder, but orcas fashion, maybe they have to have smaller heads if the fish are getting smaller. So back, <laughs> this actually is, 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 is old news. But it came out. This came out. You know, re reemerged today on IFL Science uh, And it, back in 1987, orcas had a fashion of wearing a dead salmon as a hat. So they would they would put salmon on their heads from around, which I think is incredible. You know, right now the fashion is sinking boats in Europe, but but at right, the time, right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> which uh, back in 1987, the uh, trend was to wear salmon on top of their heads. There's lots of uh, pictures and memes, of course, about that on the internet. Uh, but really fun. Again, this, was, this was a trend back in 1987. They also had uh, bigger hair. They put a lot of perfume in, uh, a lot of hairspray. <laughs> they, they wore brightly colored <laughs> clothes, and they didn't dance like they do now, so it's different. But this happened in the Puget Sound, uh, and one female orca from what they called K-Pod, the pod there, began carrying a dead salmon around on her nose. And over the next five to six weeks, that behavior spread. And by the end of it, orcas from her own and two other pods started wearing dead salmon as hats. And then just as fast as it came, um, it was over. But a few times the following summer, uh, latecomers uh, decided to wear it um, and they started seeing the trend over and over again. So it kind of comes back and in, in, in and out of fashion over the years. So exactly, it's a, it's exactly. A short story, and, but yeah, it's cool. Well, uh, you know, and I'm thinking, why didn't John Hughes make a movie about it? That's my thing. Right back when Molly it was, Ringwald out there. Yes, you know, pretty instinct. Um, you know, 
<laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Salmon head, you know, yeah, a collaboration with David, yeah. David Lynch. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but the thing right. about orcas is, well, I, can I just say, I, I want to talk about how playful they are. This is a crazy oh, yeah. thing. You know, people trying to think, why do they do that? Why do they do that? They do all kinds of crazy things, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they all, the young ones will tangle themselves in rope just to see if they can get untangled. Well, that's like something straight off a of jackass Sure. and, uh, uh, doing all kinds of things. Like they'll pursue an animal, like a porpoise and just play with it and chase it and play with it and chase it. Just like a cat. That's not even interested in having a mouse, just chase mm-hmm. it around till they worry the poor thing to death. And that's kind of an unfortunate habit that they've ob- observed in some, uh, orcas, yeah. but, uh, they, these behaviors, some of them come and go just like trends and fads and some of them uh hang around which is uh very very interesting but one thing we don't have to worry about is orca research because there are piles and piles of scientists studying them and tons and tons of citizen science about them so really cool and yeah. uh glad to be reminded of the old 80s trend with the um salmon hats salmon hats i, I, I might bring it back in style myself <laughs> <laughs> it's a good way to stay single that's for sure all right john that's the news <laughs> let's let's leave it there that was the news <laughs> all right let's move on to a conversation i had with the crappie stopper kim burnett and his side hustle crappie stopper jigs and flies Hello, Fish Nerd Nation, and welcome to the Glasswater Angling World Headquarters podcasting studio. I am so excited to have in the interview chair this morning a gentleman that is a phenomenal local hero around my part of the world. He is an educator of young fishers, he is a champion fly caster fly tire has his own jig tying side hustle called crappie stopper jigs and flies we have had him on the show before but we're going to welcome him back in a big way right now hello kim burnett hey hello what's going on well you know some things are going on the bluegill are moving toward the bank uh the white bass run is over the crappie are kind of right in the middle of their thing and um i don't know a lot of good fishing going on you've been doing any Oh, yeah, always. You know, I'm out there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. You can't keep a good man down. Well, <laughs> well, listen, we actually got to go out and fish a little bit down at the test pond. We had a ball, and you introduced me to a fly pattern called the Psycho Ant. And, uh, wow, what a good time that was. Oh, yeah. they were. Uh, that was a new fly I tried, and it seemed like they liked it pretty, wood, pretty they, good. <laughs> they sure did. They <laughs> sure did. Well, listen, Kim, I wanted to get together with you because we chatted over a few things while we were taking a break here and there from the fishing, and um, it crossed my mind that uh, you could help me answer. I get asked certain questions a lot. I mean, the number one question I get asked is, what the hell's wrong with you? And I really don't know the answer to that. And I know you have your own take on it, but we don't have time for you to answer that right now. But the second most popular question with me is how do you start a hot side hustle in fishing how do you get into making your own lures your own jigs your own flies or or something else but how do you add a little income while still having some fishing fun and you have your own business on the side you work a regular job but you have your own business on the side called crappie stopper jigs and flies and the website for that is remind me is that the website crappie stopper jigs.com crappie stopper jigs.com but you'll also find some very fine panfish patterns there as well. So I wanted to get in this morning and ask you about your side hustle. And you have an amazing propensity for doing some things on social media. And for guys our age, I know you're the you're the youngster in the group, but still mm-hmm. we're 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 close enough. And yeah. uh feel a little helpless maybe or a little uh, out of touch, unless they've got a kid in their lives that can show them how to do this social media thing. So First of all, talk to us about crappie stopper jigs and flies. How did that come about? Oh, well, I started tying um, crappie jigs like 33 years ago, and I got tired of plastics not lasting, tearing up, and 
Every time you get a short strike, you got to pull it up, put it back on, two or three fish. You got to change out, put another plastic. So I decided, hey, I'm done with this. I'm going to try to tie my own. So one time I went to Cabello's and um, guy, I went to the fly shop. I told him I was interested in tying jigs for crappie. So he showed me, you know, wrap the hook, wrap the thread on the hook, attach a couple materials. And after that, I sat down there and did it, did a few there. And I went home and messed up a whole bunch of them. And eventually I got good at it. Well, you sure did get good at it. And one thing I tell people when they ask me the question, how to get going is you have to find a niche. You have to find something that makes your product special because it is a very, very competitive game. Would you agree? Oh yeah. So a lot of new jig tires out there. There are a lot. What would you consider your specialty or what would you, what does make, what does make, there we go. For a guy that's trying to talk, I don't do a great job all the time. <laughs> what makes crappie stopper jig so special? I mean, I have things I could say, but I want to hear it from you. Oh, well, just my experience and the way they're put together, you know, they're well put together. I ain't got no fancy eyes, reptile eyes and all that. It doesn't really take all that. It's just a well-made jig and they work. I mean, that's all I can say. Well, you are a modest man, so I'm going to help you out. I'm going to tell you, first of all, your use of new age chenille is phenomenal. You have a designer's eye. You come up with some combinations that win, win, win. You have customers that have been with you, not just for years, but with for decades, because you have a lot of combinations on your website that people can get. And then you're willing to come up with more if people ask and they're willing to wait uh, for you to get the materials and the time to put them together. Uh, you tie with mostly marabou, but you do do some hackle tail jigs. You do some rubber tail jigs. Uh, you do some furl tail jigs. You do all kinds of cool stuff. And uh, mainly, I think it's just your eye for design and your knowledge as a crappie fisher for putting together those deadly combos that work ever so well. And you put together some really cool stuff, my friend. I, I really, I'm, I love your posts. I love just looking at your bugs, your choice in paint, your choice in, in body colors, and your choice in tail combinations is second to none. And your little accents and additions in terms of a flash of crystal flash, things like that are also just phenomenal. So do check them out, folks, at crappiestopperjigs.com because Kim can put together just some amazing, amazing stuff for you. All right. So now let's talk about promotion. First of all, you've got, you send out jigs and, uh, to some pros. You have some pros that use your stuff on the tournament trail. You have some just some, some more local heroes like yourself that are out there using them, posting about them, having fun with them. How do you, how do you gather these people? Do they come to you or do you seek them out or exactly how does that work? You know, they come to me, man. I just, like I said, I use social media and I've been using it since it started. And first it was word of mouth and social media came along. And I just started, you know, going live on my page for for years and had a few people, you know, joining in. And this person told that person, asked, do you sell them? And I said, yeah. This far, I even had a website. I only have had a website for like, what, four or five years now? So it was basically word of mouth and doing my lives. And you just have to be consistent in anything you do, you know? And I was going live once a week for ever. I've been doing it for like, what, eight years now going live on Wednesday nights. Okay. That is key right there. First of all, don't panic. Nobody starts out with a million viewers. Second of all, just keep going. And third of all, probably should have put this first, but be consistent because the people that want to sit and watch you tie flies and talk fly, I mean, or jigs and talk about jig fishing and crappie and so forth, uh, they, you're kind of their, um, uh, mechanism for relief for enjoyment on that Wednesday night. And then they really disappointed if you don't show up. Yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah. They are. They be calling me like, are you going live in Ireland? What if I don't? <laughs> <laughs> please, please. I got to have some crappie talk in my life. Oh, um, it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. And you have been doing it for quite a while and it's really amazing. The audience you have built up, but then when this thing, now this is a thing for our generation that, that a lot of people don't get, including me, this thing called TikTok came along and you decided to give it a try. How'd that go? TikTok's been very, very good. My son taught me into doing it. I told him I didn't want to do TikTok. You know, we old. I ain't trying to get in no other. I got enough going on. I made one video and in a week. It went viral. 451,000 views in a week. Whoa. Then after that, it's history. And I started going live on TikTok on Mondays. I said, so now I got like 8,500 something followers in less than two years. Okay. So while we're on the issue of TikTok, 
you said TikTok really introduced you to a lot of vendors and a lot of people that want to uh, have you uh, test, rep, endorse, look at their products. Uh, I know you had some of this coming in off Facebook, but you said it really, really amped up when you got on TikTok. So what's going on there? Yeah, TikTok is not just like in the U.S. It's globally. So there's people from all over the world. Man. It's like it's crazy. There's just so many comments rolling, so many people interacting. It's a lot different than Facebook. And once you get like five thousand followers, they offer you a TikTok store. So you just add stuff to your shop, and then uh, people want to collab with you, so they'll send you an invite. So we want to collab with you, and you uh, send a request for a free sample, and they'll send you a sample. And all you got to do is make a video within fourteen days. Then it's yours. Wow. Then, okay. Then anything you sell in your shop, I can have anything I want in the shop. They, we have a marketplace. I can go in and push ad, and I'll go right into my shop. So anything I sell, I get 15, 20% commission. Wow. That's fantastic. So what kind of things are in the shop? Just give us a few highlights. Oh, there's a bunch of, a lot of mostly fishing related, a lot of cooking stuff. You know, I try to put stuff in there that I like it. I know people would like, but you know, I like to cook and smoke and all that. So I got some cooking stuff on there, mostly fishing related. And, and uh, when you talk about smoke, you are talking about being a Kansas city area aficionado of barbecue correct i'm one of them you are one of them you used to be a co uh, competition barbecue guy for a while right yeah yeah i've seen i've seen some of the great stuff that you post uh coming out of that smoker and you have a, a real flair for that in fact you're just a talented man it seems like whatever you put your hand to uh comes out real well well thanks for that inside information on tiktok because i know you've been getting some some merch here and some merch there and and you you have a real good uh rapport with some sponsors uh when you're doing uh fishing education you're able to come up with some prizes and some giveaways for those kids and those those new adults uh that yeah. are learning to fish but uh when you told me about this tiktok thing it really blew my mind so you are live on tiktok on monday at seven o'clock at seven o'clock central time so you can catch crappie stopper live on tiktok mondays at seven o'clock wednesdays on facebook live what time seven o'clock seven o'clock so if you want to go over there didn't get enough off tiktok or wednesday works better for your schedule you can go over and catch kim on facebook from at seven o'clock central on wednesdays and then tell me about this group you do on tuesday because this sounds like an awful lot of fun yeah i got another i got all kind of groups want me to be on i can't be on everybody's show <laughs> i'm on a group called uh, grown folks fishing and outdoors on tuesdays at they're on Georgia, so they're an hour ahead. So it'll be seven here, six thirty here, seven thirty there on Tuesdays. Central six thirty there at seven thirty. Okay, seven thirty Eastern time, six thirty Central time on Tuesdays. Grown folks fishing and outdoors. Grown folks fishing and outdoors. All righty, and what does this consist of? Describe it for the listeners, please. Oh, we just general crappie talk. I tie jigs every week while we're talking. And we just talk fishing and people chiming in just like any other show, you know, people are watching, talking to us and asking questions. We're giving tips, tactics. What are you catching where you live? What are you catching? How did, when, when did I go fishing? How did I catch them? You know, just general crappie talk. Well, that is phenomenal. That is phenomenal. I tune in. What should I expect? I will be like, I've never done these live things. It's crazy. I've never tuned into one. I've never tried to do one I, I know that as a podcast if we had the time uh, we would be doing something similar you're kind of encouraging me to look further in that direction so let's say i tune into that it, it's you and a couple other guys how many hosts are there for the uh two other fishing two others There's okay two other and you can be a guest if you like oh well if that's an invite then i may have to take and you, you can be on. a guest on my show if you like oh wow well I'm all ready to flip the script. That would be an awful lot of fun. We're going to definitely have to plan on doing that. That's that's awesome, buddy. Yes, we, that might, yes, we do. Yeah, yeah. It would be my way to break in on TikTok, right? Because you know that I, uh, as the saying goes, I have a real face for radio. But if you're willing to risk it, uh, we could give hey. it a try. <laughs> beauty, come, beauty comes in all shades. <laughs> well, that's nice coming from a handsome guy like you who has the uh, fashionable collection of hats i've ever seen oh yeah 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 you look great <laughs> great in a hat and, yes, and now that my hair is is uh, wandering away by the day 
Um, I'm, I'm more interested in hatware than ever before. Uh, but getting back to it, okay, so any tips? You've, you've said consistency is key. It's, it's a baseline thing. But tell folks how they can get started, whether it be TikTok, Facebook, what have you. What's, what's the best way to get going? You know, use your social media to its advantage. As long as you use it for good, don't post any junk. Just keep it straight fishing. No politics, no religion. Just keep it straight fishing and um, be consistent and have something somebody wants to see. Okay. Now, that sounds good. I have watched you do do your personal one on Wednesdays, and it seems awful hard. You're, you're really uh, talented there of being able to tie and then simultaneously look up and be like, Hey, hello, Billy Bob. How's it going tonight? Then you'll tie a little bit and I'll be like, Leon, nice to see you. And, uh, you know, and then, oh, uh, uh, um, Jane just asked me about the crappie fishing at Wilson uh, here. They're still running small over there. And, you, you know, you just don't miss a beat. Uh, did that come naturally to you or did you work at it a little bit? It was just from years of time. Talking to people I had to work on because, you know, I don't, I don't do a lot of talking. But I had to learn how to talk to people because that's what you got to do. So. When I first started, it was kind of slow. I didn't talk a lot. I was just tying. And, and I got used to talking to people. And, and people are really fascinated about how fast I tie. And I can interact with people and keep tying. And I can do like two dozen an hour on a show. And they're like, man, this guy is just cranking them out. And that's what that's what keeps them, you know, that's what attracts them. This is my skill, my skill level of tying and talking. Because most people can't tie a jig in five minutes. I can tie one in one minute. And have another one up and ready to go. Yeah, I've I've seen you tie and and uh, you've you've been in some tying contests and stuff. It's it's very interesting. And folks, we will have uh, all the links for this in the show notes. Plus, uh, the first time we had Mister Burnett on, that was my very first uh, piece I submitted as a correspondent for Fish Nerds. And look at me now, Cam. I'm the hey. producer, yeah, and co-host, and I'm getting double salary. CEO. I was making zero. <laughs> now I'm up to zero point zero. And uh, they're getting ready to add another zero on there. So everybody talking about get them to add a zero to your contract. I, I think I'm going to be able to get them to do that. Um, but anyway, <laughs> what I'm hearing here is is don't be be pressured. Don't make this an anxiety thing. Start slow. Get your groove. Don't worry about how many f- followers and stuff, especially at first. Yeah. Be yourself. All right. Uh, know your business. Know what you're doing. And if you're a newbie and you want to, you know, that's another, you know, you need to have an angle and having an angle. It could be, Hey, I'm just starting out. Who wants to chime in and help me? You know, it could be anything. Yours is such an organic feed and it's such an organic thing. Um, you know, would be another thing that I would tell people is that, uh, the main thing, if you want to start a side hustle in fishing is to get started. And then yeah, as you learn, and as you go along, you know, things will get better. You'll get more ideas. You'll get more focus. You'll get, uh, see new avenues, new opportunities. But th- the main thing is just to get going. Would you agree? Yeah. And yeah, exactly. And you thing is people want to see the process. A lot of people tie, but nobody shows the process. And that's what I'm doing. I don't tie to get orders. I've been doing this forever. I don't worry about orders. I just try to show people the process. And a lot of people have started jig companies just by watching me and asking me questions and Ask me how to do this, how to do that. And I don't, I show them. I ain't got no secrets. Well, that's just great because mentorship is a great sell. Mentorship is something we all need. It's a great way to spread joy. It's a great way to truly spread your influence in a very positive way. But yeah, you tie a lot of jigs. How many jigs do you tie a year thereabouts? Last year, I tied 15,000 jigs, 1,400 flies. Whoa. That is a lot of bugs. That is a lot of tying. That is a lot of uh, evenings at the vice. But like you say, you've, you've been doing it a while. You've gotten really good at it. And holy smokes, are you looking to be in that ballpark here this year? Oh, yeah. I'm already on pace. It never stops, man. I, I always think it's going to I'm almost caught up. And I, <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just say that to help myself. Yeah, to help yourself mentally believe that you're not being overwhelmed. <laughs> you open the email and or right. answer the phone, and there you go. Get a text. Yeah, it, it's an awesome, awesome thing. You're blessed, man. Well, you are blessed, but we are blessed to have you in our lives. It is very, very cool to have made your acquaintance and become friends. We certainly have a lot, a lot of fun when we go fishing. I, I really cherish our time. It, it doesn't happen enough, but it may be happening more often because you got some news. On the personal level that I'd like to share with the listeners, you are getting to retire. 
Yes, in October, after 28 years with the Olympic School District. After 28 years with the Olympic School District, Kim is ready to retire. He's ready to get out there. He's ready to move forward. Well, I'm going to give you the last whatever amount of time you need, last two, three, four minutes here. We're running low on time, but I always give people a chance to say whatever's on their mind and to shout out their sponsors, their friends, their peeps on their end as far as uh, social media goes and uh, their role as an influencer goes. So talk to me about any issues in fishing or anything you're excited about and then finish up by shouting out some of your friends that you're um, selling their products also shout yourself out in the end and we'll get all your social media and all your stuff down at the very end but first talk to me what's going on in Kim oh, Burnett's life oh just a lot of working and a lot of fishing you know, yeah that's what I do I don't do anything else I don't want to do anything else I work come home and when I get a chance to fish I go fish yeah fish. yeah all right I know you've, you've you've done a lot of interviews you've been on a lot of shows what's coming up there in that regard oh I do. I've done quite a few shows. I just got done doing Tri Lakes Fishing Fly Fishing Expo in Clinton, Missouri. I got invited to come to the Wally Marshall uh, Invitational this year, have a booth down there in Branson, which is in November, the biggest cropping tournament in the country. So Wally Marshall invited me to come. I don't know if I'm going to do it, but I got the invite to do that anyway. Got any kid clinics coming up? Yeah, we got a. Um, uh, Vamos Estescar coming up in Emporia here, I think, in another month. Oh, and man. that's uh, it's kind of like the one that you was going to do, but we've been doing this one for like five years, me and Phil. So, and it's pretty big down there. It's at the Aquatic Education Center across from Emporia State University. They bought a pond and they built a classroom right on top of this pond. And all the migrants' families, they come out, like 150 families. We give each wow. family two, two rods and we give them a Tackle box, we give them food, we feed them, we have stations set up, we do kayaking, we do everything. Wow, that is fantastic. Well, you know Emporia, Emporia State, that's Doc Martin country. Yeah. She's going to have to bring Cece over there and let her uh, check it out, have a have a hot dog, and because and, that little girl already knows how to fish. And I'm sure if uh, <laughs> she, she got uh, met up with you, she'd be fishing even more. That's fantastic. you got a lot of stuff going on, as always. Talk to me about a couple sponsors. Who would you like to shout out today? Oh, my rod sponsor, I'd like to shout out Favorite Fishing. Uh, Big Kev Outdoors is one of my sponsors. Uh, Boat EFX is one of my sponsors. I'm looking at another one, uh, Vexen trying to get on their sponsorship they're a pro staff and that's looking pretty good sponsored by zepco sponsored by uh, catfish what's that little cat magic bait catfish bait we're oh yeah magic bait it. oh yeah oh, that's a that's a staple around here <laughs> oh yeah that's right. about it that's what helps me do what i do well that is plenty and yeah it helps you do what you do and finally crappie stopper jigs is the website facebook where do you want people to join your facebook feed how do they get into that uh, Kim Burnett. That's where I go live. Boy. All righty. And then grown folks fishing. That's on Facebook as well. Grown folks fishing and outdoors. Okay. Tune into that on Tuesdays and then Monday on TikTok. How do we find it? At, at crappie stopper jig. At crappie stopper jigs on TikTok on Monday nights, seven o'clock central. Find Kim Burnett. Kim, you've been going. I've been going. We've been missing each other here and there ever since we decided to do this, but we finally made it this morning. Thank you for coming in and you have a great day. And please tell me as soon as we're done, you're going to grab your fishing pole and head out the door. Now I'm going to cut the grass. Then I'm heading. All right. All right. <laughs> you already know that. I'm nah, that way, Carolyn will be happy when you come back because the grass will be cut, man. I got the same thing, man. I got to go right around on the ZTR for a little bit. And then I'm going to head on down to the test pond. All righty. Well, Kim, we'll see you again soon. All right, man. You take care. Thank you. You do the same. Well, did you pick up a few pointers there, Clay? You have a side hustle or kind of a, you're, I don't know if we could call your stuff side hustles. You have more like a pie chart. I, I it's a lot of hustle. <laughs> it's a lot, of hustle, a lot of hustle with. A lot of side. Lot of hustle. Does, does hustle mean make money? His does. I mean, yeah. you follow his tips. You're consistent. <laughs> yep. You, you you recognize that it's like having a second job. You know, you, mm -hmm. you stick to it. You work at it. 
Um, but yeah, a guy that ties 15,000 jigs. That's so in many. A, in a, yeah, that's a lot of <laughs> that's jigs. So and uh, I, better, I better hope he's making some money because otherwise I think we need to call somebody. Right, right. Well, the website, by the way, is crappystopperjigs.com. You want to check it out and uh, check in with uh, with Kim and buy some crap, crappy stoppers. You can do that right there on the website. So Kim is fantastic. He does so much community work. Uh, he is a great ambassador for the sport. And also, he's just a he's just a heck of a guy to go fishing with. I hope, you know, I really hate bringing people to Kansas to fish because as far as me, I, you know, I love it. It's fine. It's my home. It's I'm proud of it and all that. But yeah, it's like I say, good is about as good as it gets. You know, we don't have, we have a couple of epic things here, but they're both like the paddlefish run or the white bass run. They're kind of hard to hit. You know, it's not where you can just go, go up to New Hampshire and just zero in on perch. No problem. It, it's, it's, or trout, you know, if you, the mountains up there, mm-hmm. where you guys talk, they're just you can go up and catch brook trout, and it's it's pretty pretty easy. Well, we don't. Uh, there have are some any. days where it's easy. There are some days where <laughs> where you can't pay them. So I haven't caught one yet. <laughs> yeah, this year, I guess. So all right, all right. I went I went salmon fishing the other day, and I just threw lures into the water for an hour. Got bit by black flies, so it's not always easy. Okay, well, we, you know, we but, have our but, days. <laughs> Well, the thing is, if I'm going to draw you to Kansas, it's going to be to fish with somebody cool. It may not, we, we may just go gar fishing or bluegill fishing or something. That sounds, gar fishing sounds amazing. And so we don't have gar here. So for me, that sells it. I'm done. I'm in. That'd be a draw. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's go. All right. All right. All right. Well, one of these days, I want to get you in the same fishing zone with Mr. Burnett because he is a wonderful guy to fish with. You'll probably end up with some flies in your box because he's a generous man. And after we got done fishing, I had two psycho ants. <laughs> and I've already already busted one off on a big fish, so I still have one left. But I, you know, I got to find some stuff to trade him because I may have him tie me up some more. Well, you might as well. You, if anyone has stuff to trade, it's you, John. Well, Clay, you know what? We did it. We did do it. These fine people been sitting in here listening to us talk about fish, fishing, and eating fish when they should have been out fishing. Mm-hmm. We do want to big give a big thanks to Wally Pleasant for our theme song, Dinos Bath Salts, for our. News theme and the mysterious bait caster cylinder. Got it. Thank you for the culinary theme. Also, big thanks to Henry Thomas for the fishing blues track tribe for greaser. Amy Robinson, the Oklahoma pond lady, local legend, Kim crappie stopper, Burnett, Joe Henry, our family, especially you for uh, listening and letting us sit in your ears for the last hour. (laughs) So, That's right. And until next time, follow the code of the fish nerds. Spawn early and often. Never trust a free lunch with strings attached. And swim against the current every chance you get. You did it, John. You made a podcast. We made a podcast. (laughs) Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean, casting nets, fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a podcast. Just for the hell of it. Fry it in a basket or broiled in a pan. Eat it raw like you're in Siam. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a podcast.